Good evening. Welcome to The Directors. I'm Keith Morris. Today, we'll join host Mark Gervais, acclaimed critic and jury member at the Cannes Film Festival, as he speaks with the Danish film director, Lars von Trier, by a satellite in his home near Copenhagen. Von Trier's very name upsets the film establishment. He is not a traditional commercial filmmaker, to say the least. But his films have distinguished him as one of Europe's finest. Von Trier displays a variety of styles and techniques in his films producing stories that are cleverly composed to portray ideologies in an implicit and yet startlingly poignant fashion. Von Trier is a living testament that European filmmakers can indeed compete in the world market. The irrational, the corrosive satirist, the religious mystic, the innovative film poet. Which one is Lars von Trier? Join us as the directors explores the works of Lars von Trier. Well, Lars, you heard the introduction. You heard the cliches that uh, always come your, your way uh, and always with the idea of the provocateur, the enfant terrible, uh, the man who challenges us, the man who's challenging cinema. How do you react to being sort of categorized in that fashion? Well, first, I'm, I'm a little uh, stunned by the technique here. You know, talking to you over the Atlantic is... Uh, a fantastic thing. I um, what can I say? It sounds very American the way you kind of approach uh, <clears throat> the European directors and me in particular. But um, yeah, I, I don't think I can relate to all that. Uh, well, you know, Canada and the United States, we have this sort of economic union, so you have to forgive us because <laughs> no, I forgive you actually, for that. Yes, our absolutely. our screens are almost totally controlled by American products. Yeah, but, but you're a little more European, aren't you? A little bit more. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we've been told that. Especially, uh, we're filming this, we're doing this in, from Montreal, and Montreal uh, kind of glories in its uh, reputation sometimes as being uh, the most uh, European of North American cities. <laughs> okay. Great. Maybe that's good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I... I uh, there's one side that categorizes you this way, but I'm sure much more uh, satisfying for you is the other side, where always they bring up your uh, amazing technical innovativeness uh, and also the fact that you're referred to as the poet. Uh, very often say this is the most uh, significant, important film director that Denmark has given us since the legendary... Uh, uh, Carl Dreyer. Well, yeah. Well, um, I, I was very fond of, you know, Mr. Dreyer. I'm, I, I don't know what I represent in the Danish cinema, but um, well, maybe I can say that I am, I'm curious, you know, that I am, I am, uh, I'm investigating a little into the media. That's what I would like to, you know, have people think about me. So um, that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, I'm making my own little kind of investigation into what this is all about. So, um, and that is what Carl Dreyer did, I think. This uh, legacy there of Dreyer, I mean, do you feel trapped or do you feel exalted by sort of, you're not exactly uh, an elderly statesman yet, and uh, here you are given this, uh, it's as if you've inherited the legacy that in a way, you are responsible for bringing energy and uh, significance to the Danish cinema. Uh, yes, being saddled with a legacy. Does that, uh, do you like that kind of role? Does it give well, you a certain uh, power? Well, well, first of all, I think that Carl Dreyer was really um, a, a very strange figure. So um, um, it's not like he's, uh, well, he's considered in, in Denmark to be um, an, an interesting filmmaker, but you know, not, not a conventional filmmaker at all. He was really a very, very strange man. So, so I'm, I'm very, you know, I'm very fond of him in that sense also. He's not, he was never doing, you know, the mainstream cinema in this country, and he was certainly not a very loved man when he was alive. No, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm very fond of him. 
Uh, do you sort of see him in the way you've described him? Do you see that as sort of yourself too, in the sense that uh, here was the man who went his own way, come what may, had to pay the price for it often, uh, was not accepted by many, and still went on and, and did great work. Yeah, he, he was, I think the, the most important thing about him and, and, and a thing that I, you know, I, I, I really admire is that, that he was so serious about the things he did. He was really, he was, uh, he did not do very many films. There was uh, sometimes, there was, you know, even 10 years between them. And uh, he was extremely stubborn. He did uh, exactly what, what, he, what he was, uh, what he was, he was also investigating into an area. And then uh, he, um, he, he, he went for it and, 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 uh, and took his time and whenever there was no money, he, he just waited, <laughs> sat down and looked for even American money at some point, but uh, he, he, never, he never did any compromise. I've just been giving a course and we did Ordet. Uh, and of course, Ordet has come up uh, very much with, I guess, what is your most famous film in North America, but I would say all over the world, eh, which is still breaking the waves. And uh, uh, I notice as people write about it, uh, and even in some of your interviews, the, 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 the film Ordet uh, comes up quite often. Yes. Um, well, of course, there's a lot of Ordet in, in breaking the waves, but, but Ordet is not, well, it, you could say uh, Carl Dreyer never wrote a film from scratch. Ordet is, is, a, is a very well-known play in Denmark done by Kai Munk, a, a Danish writer. Uh, so, so what shall we say? The the idea of, or what interested me in that film was uh, the, the miracle bit and and uh, this Jesus figure, but uh, but but that is not an invention of Carl Dry. That is something that he always was, you know, he was working with these figures. But 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 uh, order or or as we call it, <laughs> yes. <Yeah. sorry. laughs> is uh, is. Um, is one of his cleanest works in that sense, but 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 yeah, what can I say? The things that interest me in it is maybe not is not what what he what he uh, what shall I say what he what he what he invented because that is that is all in the play. I can say that if if you look at the work of Carl Dreyer, you will you will find a lot of similarities and and uh, the Ma the Martha. You know, and and the, the 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 strong woman, all that, and all that is, of course, in, in breaking the waves. Also, you can, uh, yes, very much so. Because there is only one thing for us, sinners that we are, to achieve perfection in the eyes of God through unconditional love for the word that is written, through unconditional love for the law. How can you love a word? You cannot love words. You cannot be in love with a word. You can love another human being. That's perfection. No woman speaks here. Bess McNeil, the Kirk session has no, decided this day that henceforth oh, you shall no oh, longer have access to this Kirk. Oh, they who know you please shall let me not stay. know you. Please. Be gone, Bess McNeil, from the house of God. Well, the real Christ figure, as I see it, is, is the woman, really. It's not uh, the insane... Uh, uh, brother, but uh, but uh, this notion of Christ and Christ being considered a madman, a fool, and all that, um, and when I think of uh, of your lead in breaking the waves, uh, is there kind of a, a, an aspect? Because I know you've spoken about your religious side, about uh, your uh, conversion to Catholicism, uh, and all that. Is there a feeling in you that? In a sense, the, the, the mad brother who thought he was Christ, well, uh, <laughs> that notion attracted you a lot. 
<laughs> yes, well, it, 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 it's, uh, it, yes, it, it attracted me, but I will say that there's a big difference because I don't think that Carl Dreyer was a religious person, even though he made a lot of films about religious, religious subjects. Uh, I, I, I don't think he, in private, was a religious person at all. I think he, uh, he was, this was kind of, uh, what should we say, the, the archi history or archery archi type of history that he was working with all the time. And uh, he was interested, but he was not a religious person. I, 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 I must say that I, 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 I'm more religious than Carl Dreyer was, I think. As we get into uh, breaking the waves, deliberately, because so many people have seen it, and therefore will kind of refer uh, easily uh, to, to what we're, we're talking about. Um, uh, once again there, this, uh, this Christ figure business, and you, and you've said this in interviews, wanting to make this film because precisely you wanted to make a religious film. Now, what do you mean by religious? Or uh, take the thing religion, take the thing mysti the mystical, take the notion of God. I mean, how do you relate those three? Because you have said you're not mad about the traditional organized church. What can I say? Um, maybe, you know, I don't have a big, uh, I, I don't know a lot about religion. I was not from a religious family. I just uh, picked up a little here and there. But, but what, I, what I am talking about in Breaking the Waves is maybe more, you know, being good. And of course, there's a there's a mystic aspect to it also, but but it it, uh, it you can boil it down to uh, uh, a discussion about you know being good or anyway having a side in you that are good. I think that uh, these discussions that Bess has you know with God, you could you you could describe them also as you know being a discussion with you know the God within yourself. So uh, it could be kind of her discussing you know the two sides of her discussing. So, yeah. so, uh, so, well, I'm not the right person to answer what, what religion is, but, but, I can, I, but I can relate to, you know, uh, being good or trying to be or, you know, the part of you that, that is good. Well, I, I accuse myself, Lars, of asking you impossible questions. <laughs> no, no, uh, but it's just I'm that I'm, being... I'm, I'm not very clever, you know. No, I'm, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I, I might be able to do some films, but I, I don't know about the world and, you know, <laughs> and why we are alive and all that. I thank you for the greatest gift of all, the gift of love. I thank you for Jan. I'm so lucky to have been given these gifts. But remember to be a good girl, Bess. For you know, I giveth and I taketh away. What? I didn't mean it like that. Yes, I'll be good. I'll be really, really good. The directors will return in a moment. We now return to the directors with Lars von Trier. In Breaking the Waves, uh, you... Uh, you treat that group of, uh, that sect of Christians, you treat them rather ferociously. And you, uh, you communicate to us and we share it as we watch these, these dreadful people who really are a mockery of, of, of religion. Uh, um, and at the same time, you, uh, you reach out for this other dimension which uh, Emily Watson obviously has. And it's as if uh, you're saying there, Am I putting too much, or am I putting words in your mouth that organized religion, well, maybe that's not the real religion. Maybe the real religion is something more, as you say, goodness and the mystical and that sort of thing? Yeah, well, all I can say is that I think that religion to me is a very personal thing. I'm, you're talking about Catholicism, and yes, uh, I... I can, the the uh, the true religion is is for me very personal and and i don't think it has a name but you know 
I'm, I'm uneducated in these matters, so uh, you must forgive me. Uh, the uh, breaking the ways now, one of the uh, aspects, a huge aspect that people kept speaking about was precisely, again, your uh, technological bravura or so on. For example, a film on this kind of topic and you had these uh, um, cameras, you know, uh, shoulder cameras, the movement, the jerky movement, the continual uh, sort of pushing us, the audience around, uh, as well as the um, characters. And now this was a very, very deliberate choice on your part. And what is the mystique behind this? Why do you use that method? Well, to put it very simple, uh I am trying to make, what shall we say, a collision between the style and the content, or if you, if you want to make it very theoretical, um, to, to make uh, things stronger, you know, it, it's, uh, I don't know, it's, it becomes very ph philosophical, <laughs> but, but uh, uh, if you want to, uh, to get some attention with a story, then you should... Uh, or I, I think it's a good idea to, to approach it a little differently from what it has been approached before. And uh, one way could be to not have, uh, to not use the style you would normally use for this kind of, 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 of story. That is, well, it's putting it very simply, but, but, but uh, to see the style and the content kind of, content kind of uh, collide, uh, that is, uh, I think, has been a good technique for me uh, sometimes, yes. To me, this uh, handle camera style and this, what you would say, very human style of filming, or f I would like to call it, it does kind of, it, it um, what shall I say, it, it, it makes the whole film more human, even though the subject is non-human in that sense, since it's, it's about, you know, miracles and religion and um, it, 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 it is, uh, you could compare it with, you know, you could see a, a film of, you know, the Pope giving a, a, a mass somewhere and I don't know, whatever, in, in, in some big church and, and you could see some uh, little kid, uh, poor kid somewhere who is, who is uh, enjoying religion in the sense that it gives him something in his everyday life. This is just one example, but it's just that that you that I prefer to take the human attitude and to take the human point of view, and that is what I do by using this very human technique. Dear Bess, I've known you for six years, and I can definitely say you have the biggest heart of anyone I've ever met. It wasn't easy for me here when I married Sam. But you welcome me instantly, and I won't ever forget that. Your generosity knows no bounds, like the time when you lent Jack a bike because his was broken, only it was mine and I had to walk to work. <laughs> I was furious with you then, but I regret that now, because it's your spirit. You'd give anything to anyone. Is it too that you want to, using that kind of, of method, you want to get us uh, uh, as if we were there, sort of 
uh, the way we're looking around and the way, you know, reality is all sorts of things happening that uh, it's not always beautiful, smooth, planned movements. And so your technique just brings us into it like that? Yeah, that's of course a, a part of it. That is, um, what should we say, that is, uh, this handle camera technique uh, or the, the documentary technique or whatever, that is very much uh, what people are doing these days. And that is of course because uh, you, uh, you pretend that this is for real in another sense than, than, than you would if you kind of work very traditionally with your camera and your editing. But I think further than that, it also to this film, and that was what I was trying to say, was that it that it that it gives this uh, very human touch to the whole thing. That that this is not something that is extremely planned and calculated. This is something that has there's almost you know a, a random effect to where the camera would move to. And this, I think, in my mind, has a lot to do with religion. You know, religion to me is very much giving away control to some force that might be bigger than you, or very much <laughs> is very much bigger than you. And uh, giving away control is also for me to let the camera be a handle camera and let it, you know, move more or less as it want to, or as you know, the story where the story takes it. Well. If we go back to your previous films, it's, uh, well, you became internationally very well known with Europa, but even before Europa, you had made a few feature films. And is there a kind of, do you see the way you've evolved? Again, these are big, uh, complicated questions. But as you reflect on these, these things, as I'm sure you have, is there a sort of, uh, gradual development going on and that you're always pushing more. I don't know your earliest works, for example, your student works or so on, no, no, but no. the you're, films before you're, you're Europa. A happy man then. Hmm? Yes, you are. You're, it's, it's good you haven't seen them. Because are, you able, are you able to look at them yourself? No, 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 no. No? no? But do you feel that even there you, uh, there's a, a loosening up, a loosening up, say, even of the camera or something like that? Uh, as, uh, to reach a point as you did in Breaking the Waves. Or, um, for example, Breaking the Waves is very different to Europa, stylistically. Yeah. Eh? And in Europa, you seem to be unhappy that, uh, was it in Europa that, uh, yes, it was your second time you were getting the technical prize at the... Uh, oh, yes, yes, that I'm, I'm avoiding that now. I and that, that upsets you. <laughs> yes, that's why I'm, that's why I I'm working. I think it upset another famous film director as well, named Polanski. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah, well, uh, I can only say that, that if, if you look at my early works and, and what I'm doing now is that I'm, the things that I'm doing now are much simpler. And that is actually how Carl Dreyer was working all the time. He's, when he wrote a script, he started, you know, with 600 pages or something like that. And then when he did the film, it was 50 pages. So it's, uh, he's kind of making things simpler all the time. And that's, uh, that's more or less the technique I have, you know, worked with in my career, you could say. The getting, getting back to uh, that question of evolving as you've gone along towards simplicity, uh, Europa was an extraordinary film visually. Uh, you, you, you must have labored for some of those incredible effects. Uh, it really brought us back. Some people have said, yeah, well, it was almost like Fritz Lang and uh, Metropolis. And these people, these haunted people uh, marching along and massed together, all this sort of stuff and these colors. Uh, have you really abandoned that totally? Or is that yeah, a... Well, that's a good question. Um, I, I think that if you look at, at the very early films and, and, and what I'm doing today, it is more or less the same story. And that is, <clears throat> if, you, if you analyze it, then you find out that it's, you, there, there's more or less only one story you can tell in your life. And that's what I'm doing. But I think that I'm going as... as being simpler in the technique and being simpler in the 
and the the way I'm I'm telling the story, I think that I I'm 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 uh, purifying. Um, and 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 if you look at it from from the outside, you you can say there's a big difference between Europa and and breaking the waves, and and certainly to the films that I'm doing now. But I, to me, it's a purification. Yeah. Bitte. Kat ist ein hübsches Mädchen. You stay away from her. Ich wollte mich nur bedanken für neulich. Das hat ja gut geklappt mit meinen beiden Neffen im Zug. Ich weiß gar nicht, was die Kleinen ohne sie gemacht hätten. Open the door, please. Weiter oben im System war man sehr zufrieden mit ihrer Hilfe beim Ravenstein-Attentat. Please open the door. Wir haben sie für eine neue Aktion im Auge. Aber da ist ja ihre kleine Freundin. Hören Sie, Leo, ich verlange ja gar nicht, dass Sie sich sofort für eine neue Aufgabe entscheiden. Ich denke, wir bieten Herrn Kessler an, ihn nach Frankfurt zurückzufahren. Und dann muss übrigens die hintere Tür repariert werden. Die klemmt. You love her. She is so strong. And yet so vulnerable. I want you to go forward in time. Go forward one month in time. Be there on the count of three. One, two, three. The directors will return in a moment. We now return to the directors with Lars von Trier. There's a scene in uh, Europa, and as I saw it, I kind of relived my tendency, a certain tendency in uh, certain circumstances to have claustrophobia. And uh, that, of course, is when our hero or anti-hero is drowning at the end. But time and again, he just feels so enclosed. Uh, this uh, this seems to be quite often a figure in uh, in your movies. Uh, yes, and that is exactly how I feel right now. <laughs> the, 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 this 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 thing, these the phobias that afflict us, you know. Yes. Is is your cinema, in a sense, is that one of the things that nourishes it, and that you communicate? Well, I, I mean hmm. Emily Watson too. She's kind of locked in, you know, and. She has this dialogue with uh, with God and but yeah. Yes, but we all are, you know, within this fragile body we have. Um, yeah, you're right. That's all I can say. <laughs> that is, it it it. Uh, there's a tendency of uh, this subject being in all of the films. Yes, it must be something to do with me. A series that, uh, unfortunately, in Canada has not yet been seen totally, uh, and uh, it has been shown, the first part of the kingdom has been shown in, in French in, in Montreal, but uh, part two, no, and I believe you've already completed uh, a good set part of part three? No, I'm, 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 I'm actually writing the script right now. For part three? Yeah, but and that, some, some of the actors are <coughs> yeah. unfortunately dying, so I have to get up, come up with oh, some dear. good ideas. Yeah. Um, and uh, you, uh, that's going to end, that's going to end the kingdom. Right? Oh, definitely, yes, yes. Yes. Uh, well, that, that again, in terms of uh, the most important question in the universe, the evolution of Lars von Trier. Yes. <laughs> in terms of that, uh, that's a big, uh, big, well, not exactly departure, but it's a big uh, adventure on your part. Are you, are you very pleased and satisfied with it? No, not at all, no, not at all. With the kingdom? No, 
No, I, I um, <clears throat> it is, well, it's it's uh, it's uh, it's a big pleasure to do it, but I I, I I don't feel like I have you know achieved a lot with it. But it it was kind of uh, you know when you take a little time off and you just do something like a hobby. That is how I feel about the kingdom. Uh, at times, I thought that you were you were having fun and you were kind of laughing with your audience mm -hmm. and at your audience, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, well, I don't know if I'm laughing at them, but I'm with them is a good, uh, that, that I would, uh, I, I like to do, yes. Yeah. Uh, I do know that uh, in some of the American reviews of it and so on, they were comparing it a lot with uh, Lynch's uh, Twin Peaks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand that, yeah, and, it, it's, and it's, uh, it's, it's definitely also inspired by it, by Twin Peaks, sure. What, what do you think of, of uh, Mr. Lynch? Well, as I, a film director. Well, as a, I, I um, when when uh, when you f when you are very close in a sense, you know, when you look at it superficially, then you would say that 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 the style could be and the way of working could be quite close. But then, uh, I, I, when I see his film, I don't like them. I must say, I I, I was very very fond of the. Of the of Twin Peaks, it was especially the first episode I saw it was brilliant, brilliant, and it was a, a a unique way of going into this uh, almost soap environment and 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 work with it that way. It was it was I was very pleased with that. But 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 his films tends to be too much also because <clears throat> I believe that the universe, his universe, are in a sense quite close to mine, or anyway, the ideas are very close. And then, uh, I don't know, as a director, you don't like to see them. I, I feel the same about some, you know, uh, modern directors, you know. I, uh, there are certain films I, I, I can't bear to see. <laughs> that doesn't mean that they're bad, but it's just I can't bear to see them. And, and I, I don't think, uh, Lynch, I, I, I can't... Um, I saw, uh, one of the first films I saw of him, of course, was Eraser had a long time ago, and I, I saw half an hour, and then I turned it off. I um, no, it was too much for me. <laughs> Maybe the same way people feel about my films. <laughs> well, I hate once again to sound like the critic, you know, who has analyzed everything to death. But um, I have a feeling that uh, yeah, I can see I can see a, a certain resemblance in some of the things that you people do in your movies. Um, and certainly that wonderful consciousness, almost a, almost a cynical consciousness. But in his case, I find it is cynical. There's no answer. It just bang. Whereas in your case, there's always that leap into something beyond us. Uh, well, well, that's <laughs> that's very Which flattering. Would but but I I don't know if if it's true. But I, I think that in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in these little glimpses that I see, or for instance, in the first episode of Twin Peaks, I think it's, 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 it's not only very good filmmaking, I think it's, it's much more than that, I must say. Grunden under Rigshospitalet er gammel muse. Her lå plejedammen en gang. Her gik plejemændene og fugtede deres store lærder i det lave vand for at lægge til plejning. Fordampningen indhyllede stedet i en permanent tåge. Senere byggedes Rigshospitalet her, og plejemændene blev skiftet ud med læger og forskere og landets bedste hjerner og mest fuldendte teknologi. Og som kronen på værket kaldte man stedet for riget. Nu skulle livet defineres, og uvidenhed og overtro aldrig mere kunne ryste videnskaben. Måske er det blevet for meget med hovedet og den konsekvente fornægtelse af det åndelige. For det er som om kulden og fugten er vendt tilbage. Små tegn på træthed er begyndt at vise sig i de ellers så solide og moderne bygninger. Ingen levende ved det endnu, men porten til riget er begyndt at åbne sig på ny. I 
was at Cannes this year, and uh, you had your film, The Idiots at Cannes. And it, uh, as you, I'm sure you must know, you, you know that in terms of the publicity handouts and all that sort of things, uh, that it was coupled in a sense with, uh, with Vinterberg's movie. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, in a nice red envelope uh, proclaiming Dogma 95. You remember that? Yes, yes, why not? Yes. Why not? yes. And uh, now I'm, I'm again intrigued by Dogma 95 because there you are, you're a group, you were a group of uh, six or eight directors or something? Yeah, five, yeah. Five. Okay, and you you have to uh, you take the, your vow of chastity, as you put it, <laughs> yes. and there are ten commandments there mm -hmm. that you must promise to follow. Uh, do, now, your, do your best to follow. Yes. Do your best to follow. Yeah. And uh, well, I have ideas, but uh, what's what's this? What's was this kind of a joke, or a kind of a, a provocative act, or is it? Uh, is it a movement that you people very, very seriously intend to maintain? Now, this was 1995. Yeah, well, I, I don't know if it's something we want to maintain, but, but, but I see, you know, um, <clears throat> well, simplification and l limits uh, as, as very, very strong tools for art work. And, um, uh, this, these are some limits that we put on our work, and uh, that means that that all that there's a lot of, of uh, things we cannot decide on. You know, we can't decide to use music on the film unless we do it a certain way. All these things, and and that gives us what shall we say? Much more time to do the things that we can decide on. You you get my meaning? Yeah, yeah. Because I have I have the manifesto here in front of me. And uh, it says, the supreme task of the decadent filmmakers today is to fool the audience. Mm. But that's exactly what we struggle against. Uh, and don't, uh, don't read it to me. <laughs> <laughs> and you, but you feel like shooting must be done on location. Mm. OK. That's, you're not the first to have said that, if, if possible. But uh, optical work and filters, for example, are forbidden. Uh, the film must not contain superficial action. That is to say, murders, weapons, and so on must not be there. Yes, but I think that the most important thing is that there are some rules, not what the rules are. You know, it could be any set of rules, and, and it could be interesting to, to do it, you know, uh, this and, and this way. It's like it, climbing a mountain, you know. Then you put up a rule saying you shouldn't have oxygen with you when you climb a mountain. That's just a rule. You could just as well do it with oxygen, but it's another, uh, the climb is going to be different, and it's another task if you put on some, 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 some limitations to your... So, <coughs> so if I understand, it's one antidote to the, the way that today films, whether they be from Europe or anywhere else, are all the same in, in one sense. Well, and it, yeah, They're just yeah. kind of these 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 uh, cliche illusions. Well, it's um, our our goal was of course a little bit the same as you know the new French wave or whoever wanted to kind of refresh the cinema and and uh, certainly what shall we say look for for the basic qualities of our own filmmaking. So, in a sense, and you're not at all, you don't look the same at all, but in a sense, a man like Jean-Luc Godard was probably a big influence on you. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, he was, but he, he, he I would say that, that uh, Truffaut was, was the most, uh, was, was the one who made the films that I liked the most. But That's I would amazing. Say, yeah, yeah, but but that is it has a little bit to do with the same, the same discussion as with uh, Mr. Lynch. Uh, that, that, that in a certain point when it becomes, when you understand the theoretical side <laughs> too much. Maybe I don't know if this makes any and, sense. And Truffaut, and Truffaut uh, in a sense, you, uh, you found him more pleasurable to watch. Yeah, because he was more naive. 
right? He was yeah. he was not he was uh, he was he used the same what shall we say kind of limitations you could say, but but he, it was more felt than thought. The directors will return in a moment. We now return to the directors with Lars von Trier. Uh, I, as I try to kind of understand what's happening uh, and so on, where they are, uh, to me they stand out, and to me that's extremely deliberate on your part, they stand out as extraordinarily different from anything else we see. And I think that's what you want to do. Huh? Uh, now, your next well, well, one, yeah, yes, sorry? Yeah, well, then that's maybe what I want to do, but I, 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 I am, I, I still think that I'm, I'm kind of, Sticking for this little diamond or whatever that might be some there somewhere, and I haven't found it yet, and I'm still trying, and I'm maybe I never find it, but uh, but I'm 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 certainly willing to use a lot of unconventional tools to find it. Well, here's the kind of question interviewers always ask: uh, What is it that you've done where you think you've come closest to finding that little diamond? The idiots. Really? Yes. The idiots? Yes. Oh my. <laughs> I don't know, maybe because this about, you know, it was more felt than it was thought. Uh, could you explain that a little bit more? <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather not. Um, <laughs> Maybe it's, it's just a, because... It's a it's shocking movie. I, will, I totally agree. <laughs> yeah, but it's, somehow, in some of... Some of so the peak moments of this film it's uh, it it um, describes the the what should we say the the joy of the media and even though some a lot of my films have been been very sinister you know or dark or whatever uh, it is actually the joy of the filmmaking that it all has to do with. Um, that's, to me, there's some kind of, what shall we say, truth lying there somewhere, you know, in, in the, the joy of... of the, and, and that is why I'm, I, I was so fascinated by, what shall we say, you know, the new French wave or... Well, I don't know if we call it swinging London, but you know, mm -hmm. at the same time in England, these explosions of creativity happened, and and I think there there lies a big fascination anyway for me in in film, that that it doesn't matter so much what you're talking about; it's just the 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 the, the joy of the communication actually. But 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 uh, but. It it because it's it's done with such limited such limited tools, it um, there's some there's some more truth in it. <laughs> you've uh, no you've you've given me an, I an insight about this film that I I must confess I, I didn't have and you're you're forcing me to go and see it again. <laughs> no no because no. Because a lot of people felt that that one uh, they felt a disappointment especially after breaking the waves mm -hmm. you know which was so. Uh, relatively popular. Yeah. Uh, 
And then they comforted, or we comforted <laughs> ourselves with the thought, yes, but we hear that he's preparing a musical. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, what's the title again? The Dancer? The dance well, we don't really know. Right now it's called Dancer in the Dark. Dancer in the Dark. Now, yes. are you going to uh, have that as... Well, I shouldn't be asking questions like that. But I mean, is this going to be a pursuit of the improvisational quality of uh, the idiots? Or is it going mm -hmm. to be a little bit more of a return to some kind of genre? No, no, no. I can... Uh, if you can... Um uh, you will be very glad to hear that it will, will not be so improvised. <laughs> it will not be as simple. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> now and I'm trying to please an audience ex instead of me. No, I'm. Uh, I, I was always very fond of musicals, and uh, and uh, in my own way, I'm trying to do a musical as I think it should look today. Well, well, can you comfort us now and tell us uh, some of the musicals that you really liked? Oh, but I like all the old ones that, that you like also, I'm sure. Yeah. I like Singing in the Rain and West Side Story very much, of course. Yeah. So it's, it's the big ones. Yeah. And uh, so uh, without asking you to tell us the movie before you make it, which in any case wouldn't be accurate, how could it be, uh, we can look forward to uh, seeing something that is quite different from you this, this time. Well, it's um, no uh, uh, breaking the waves and the idiots and this dance in the dark is three films that are in, f in the, the, they are a family of films and they all have the same kind of female you know uh, character in them. That's I'm talking about Karen in the idiots and Bess in breaking the waves. Uh, but it's going to be a more in, it's going to be a more conventional film, but not a conventional musical. What is going on? Are you sleeping with other men to feed his sick fantasies? He did get better. No, he did not get better. That's just the way it goes, Bess. Sometimes he's better, sometimes he's worse. Nothing to do with what you're doing. That's all in your mind. He is my husband, and God has said that I must honour him. Well, if that's what honouring's all about, then I must have something wrong. Well, you don't come from around here, do you? No, and I'm glad I don't. With locals talk, it makes me sick. But you live here, and you go to the church. Yes, but I don't mean I don't look at things my own way. Why don't you move in? Your husband's dead. You know very well why I don't move. I don't move because of you. A woman has to choose for herself, Bess. She has to have a mind of her own. Now, what you're doing is making things worse. It's nonsense. His, his head's full of scars. He's up to his eyeballs in drugs. He doesn't know what he's saying. And he doesn't know. How are you going to succeed in making a musical, uh, presumably in Denmark, for a, the Danish market, and a, yet a film that I would think demands international distribution and all of that. I mean, how do you navigate in these very, very difficult waters? No, but this, this film is going to be in English. Uh, um. And uh, it's actually taking place in, uh, in America. Interesting. Yes, <laughs> it's interesting since I'm not going there. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but they didn't go to Casablanca when they did Casablanca, so I think yes. it can be done. And, and uh, so you think it will have that kind of uh, familiarity, shall we say, in one sense, that, you know, people will, the box office will respond? Oh, yes, I'm, I'm very sure, I'm very sure. Yeah. Well, uh, it, but in a way, how do you, it's always the mystery, it's always a shame. I, uh, I always go to the Cannes Festival and uh, so many other festivals too where you get the opportunity of seeing movies, very good movies from all kinds of places. Uh, but you know they're not going to get international distribution. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, how do you face up to this phenomenon? Uh, do you, um, I mean, do you feel you're condemned to being kind of on the margin and that... Uh, you just have to hustle there in your small area, or, or do you feel that there's some way of, of, of 
getting getting the world to look at all kinds of things, you know? Well, I'm, I'm not really uh, <coughs> thinking about that. I, I, I started on the first film I did called Element of Crime was also in, in English, and uh, it, it went to the competition in Cannes, and from there on, I, it seems that I have a small distribution, lots of places, which is good for me. Yeah. Um, I must say that this musical is, uh, you know, I, when you have a bigger budget, then you, you have to reach a bigger audience. That is very simple, otherwise you would, <coughs> it would be very stupid. So, and this is the biggest budget I'm, I, I, I've had. So I'm, I'm, uh, this film is aimed at a much bigger audience than, or than the idiots for, for sure. Well, uh, I, I'm thinking now of the kind of question that uh, it's a lovely way as you come towards the end of, a, of an interview a conversation. And we ask you, uh, well, 10 years from now, but I think that's much too soon. Uh, uh, 30 years from now, as you, uh, when you've made your last film, or perhaps even later than that, uh, how, how would you like to be... 30 days from now, yes. 30 years. Days, okay. <laughs> well, look, perhaps you'll be making them into your 80s as well, who knows. But uh, how would you like to be remembered as a filmmaker? Well, I would like to be remembered a little bit like <clears throat> Carl Dreyer is remembered is that he's he, he took it serious, right? He took it seriously. He took it seriously and he 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 loved the filmmaking and he took it seriously and and uh, because he he uh, he was in love with, with the media and he was a humanist he uh, knew that it was important to uh, always work with what shall we say the, uh, the 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 media and the tools for it you know with, with the, the way films looked and the way we are telling a story because it has to do with communication also i think he, he no to be remembered as an honorable <laughs> man right that's what i'm so that's what I'm working on. I'm, I haven't achieved it yet, and I will not achieve it, I'm very sure. But I'm, if you ask me what my goal is, honorable, yes. Listen, I, I wish you the very best. And Same to uh, you. as your films come, we catch up with them. If we've missed them, you know, okay. I'm going to be making a point of, of becoming terribly learned in uh, Lars van Trier. Okay, okay, great. <laughs> but so, I, I promise you that the next film would be a little more <coughs> accessible. Okay. Well, I listen, promised you that. Uh, I shall. I shall spread the the good news. Okay, to the very good news. Now he's, he's back on the right track. That's this edition of the directors. Our host Mark Gervais has taken us on a brief tour of the works of Lars von Trier. The depth and the nature of his films, of course, could best be appreciated simply by viewing them. I'm Keith Morris, and this has been the directors. Join us again as we continue to explore the lives and the motivations and the creations of the top film directors of our day.